So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, my name is Agosa Omoigui, and, and I am managing partner of Echo VC. We're seed and early stage technology venture capital firm um, with three offices in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, Arabi, Kenya, and, uh, and London. Uh, we make um, investments in tech and tech-enabled startups um, that are Africa-focused and uh, targeting um, both traditional and non-traditional segments. So today, um, what I was looking to do was to share some observations um, our team had picked up over the course of our investing activity, as well as you know our thesis building activity, and and hopefully we can we can we can give you some of our own line of sight observations and and spark some 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 thoughts on that. So the first big observation, you know, from, from what we're seeing activity-wise from Nigeria is sort of the rise of the API economy. Now, this is not technically new in sort of more global markets, um, but it is beginning to have a little bit of traction in our local market. Now, what is an API? For those who are not familiar with this, it is essentially defined as an application programmable interface and what they really are, you know, in the simplest of terms, is just pipes that allow you to pull information to and from applications um, on the web and, 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 and sort of non-web-based applications as well. The average developer uh, now is using approximately 18 APIs to power their applications. And what you're finding is that people are essentially creating these assembly-like uh, structures where almost very similar to sort of how you build a house where you know some subcontractors are responsible for doorways some contractors are responsible for the foundation some for the for the walls some for the roofs um, some for the stairs some for you know you know plumbing HVAC and the like now why this is super interesting is that you know this you know the API economy is really designed to be plumbing infrastructure for what we'll call the traditional, traditional, non-traditional industries. So we're very excited about it. We, you know, we, as you recognize here, there's, a, there's an increasing amount of collaboration that's occurring via API. And what we are seeing now is, is that beginning to show up in, in the Nigerian ecosystem. So what is a typical startup API integration? So you have sort of the, the web application on one end, um, and you have this, this, this connection that gives you visibility, reliability, data privacy controls. That's sort of your basic plumbing. And this, this slide gives you a rough idea of how these companies that range from, you know, after stalking, Paystack, Barter, Nibs, um, they then use APIs to give, uh, you know, third parties access to, to both the application's uh, data as well as its, its, its runtime. Why we find this interesting, particularly because in the last year it's sort of becoming the, the space du jour in Nigeria, is that it may, in our view, start to reflect signs of a maturing or slowly maturing fintech ecosystem. You know, of course, lots of people over, over the last few years have been, you know, screaming blue murder about the rise of fintech uh, globally. Uh, but what you're finding, I think, more than anything else, is that, you know, we're seeing not just activity you know, at the infrastructure or sort of underground level, but, you know, above above ground, right? So you're seeing lending, you're seeing a lot of mobile money agency infrastructure, you're seeing third-party developers, you're, you know, you're seeing payment, you know, rails. And so with this, what I would call sort of the generating demand for both, you know, you know, incorporating information and, and data and generating information and data and having these islands sort of become connected, um, you find there's a, an increasing need to get, um, you know, what we call sort of a three-dimensional picture of, of customers and their behavior. So the examples we have on this slide, you know, are different types of examples. But what you see that is, you know, what is consistent in the evolution of these of the API ecosystem is that it is really a, a, a format to syndicate knowledge. 
you know, at the at the point of consumption or the point of aggregation or the point of execution. And you know, examples being me, one pipe, mono, okra, you know, run by really great entrepreneurs, you know, are sort of you know driving this. Now, why we think this is a sign of an adventure ecosystem is that the API ecosystem as well is 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 micro is is really sort of micro dollars or micro naira or or micro you know king and shillings. Um, you have to do you know tremendous volumes to make any kind of real money. And and what's interesting as well is that you know in the first you know iteration of fintech where you could, were doing sort of payment processing, you know you could sort of you know create what we call the agric foul mentality, which is, you know, you turn a lot of volumes, you know, you're pushing a ton of, 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 of currency through it. Um, and it, it looks, you know, these companies look really gigantic, you know, but of course, then when you now sort of take them into the kitchen and figure it out, you find out that the nutritional, nutritional content is actually on the low side, right? And so what you're now finding as well is people are now saying, well, there is that, but, you know, there's a lot more volume in, in sort of API calls and the like, and maybe we can do that. We also think that this is sort of, you know, entrepreneurial sort of maturation because at the end of the day, you are going to sort of take your time to build these things and 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 people are sort of playing the long game, which, which we like a lot. Now, many of you don't know Plaid, but, you know, Plaid was formed, I think it was seven years ago, um, with a goal of sort of enabling connectivity. What we've always found interesting, and I'm sure many of you know this, what we found interesting in the financial services ecosystem across markets is that the US, as big and as you know, as dominant as it is, you know, is, is quite backward in many in many elements of its financial services ecosystem. And so Plaid was formed with the goal of sort of you know connecting these dots. You know, and some of you may, may remember mint which was essentially trying to give customers a single line of sight across their account activity and you know that was not the easiest process to to do uh, for the founder aaron and you know and they were eventually sort of acquired but it was brutal upstream work and so plaid eventually had to sort of sue to ensure that it could get access to customer data now you know that has turned out to be a gigantic win you know visa announced you know in its intent to acquire Plaid for 5.3 billion, Plaid was doing approximately 80 million dollars in, in revenue. So on a multiples basis, was incredibly, um, you know, healthy. Um, and you know, what's also interesting, I think, is that you know, if you talk to insiders in the know, they never thought it was a very good product, all right? And so, you know, and as one of my old friends, Luke Nosek, always told me, he was like, "Listen, if you're able to build a product that sucks less than what's in, in play or what's out there." you can build a multi-billion dollar business. And so key takeaway here is if you can build a better Plaid, I think you can do better than even what Plaid did. So bringing it back to sort of Nigeria, what the activity has been sort of interesting, Okra announced a million dollar raise led by our friends at TLCom, um, superstar founder. Um, One Pipe joined Techstars New York, raised the pre-seed, another superstar founder. Mono raised uh, 500K from, from lateral capital and some angels. Uh, and Ping may raise $2 million in pre-series A uh, from a host of investors. The second sort of big trend we're seeing is crypto adoption. Now, one of the things about crypto, I think, is that it's, it's best known for its volatility, right? And unfortunately, you know, it is sort of, and there's a, and it is full of a bunch of very interesting people. I mean, if you go on Twitter, uh, crypto Twitter on any day of the week, you know, you, you just want to run away because it's just it's just insane. Uh, but bringing that back to to where we are, um, this, you know, we always love these these types of segments that show up as a result of unintended consequences. And Centre Bank of Nigeria's capital controls and forex restrictions, and you know, and adjustments of of of, of the Naira's value against the dollar and other foreign currencies, I think has, has created a, a, an interesting uh, groundswell of, of distrust, right? Um, as well as frustration. Right? And so you now, you know, you now have, you know, evolving policies from the central bank. Um, you know, you know, you can't credit Forex inflows. 
Um, you can't transfer monies that you know you deposited in cash. You can't do. You can't transfer them electronically. Then the CBN says yes, you can. Then the bank tells you no, you can't. They, they won't. Um, you know, and there are all these these you know, limitations. And you know what we we've always sort of really appreciated, and and I think that's you know it's one of the themes that we've talked about historically, is that the the African economic participant, whether you know small business uh, consumer, is generally speaking anti fragile. I mean, to the point where they have the ability to to respond to disorder and chaos and a lack of organization. And so the disorder and sort of chaotic responses generated by, you know, capital controls and forex restrictions have essentially opened up the opportunity to sort of drive cryptocurrency adoption. And so, you know, Nigeria is leading sub-Saharan Africa in terms of sort of P2P Bitcoin trading volumes. And, you know, and we expect this to grow. Now, as a defensive strategy for, you know, for forex volatility, I think that there's going to be some interesting stuff. But, you know, I, you know, again, you can sort of drive, you know, pretty decent revenues on, on these platforms. Our, our sense, though, is that the underlying technology that fuels cryptocurrency, the blockchain, is so much more interesting, you know, sort of in the long game. And, and, and it, 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 it can be sort of packaged to figure out and solve one of the key things that we see in these markets, which is just a fundamental lack of trust um, across segments. So that's something I think we're particularly excited about. But we also think that, you know, no matter what the regulators are going to try to do, this horse has left the stable and, you know, and, and hopefully more entrepreneurs can do things, you know, in this space. And so, you know, investment wise, you know, there's been a lot of very interesting stuff over some of the last two years, uh, starting from companies that, you know, like Sure Remit that went out and raised $7 million in ICOs. Um, so the first set of ICOs, then you've got the, you know, Aza, which is formerly known as BitPesa, that has raised $15 million, you know, buy coins and a few of the Nigerian companies have gone into YC, you know, doing bit, so, so crypto. And then you're seeing now more and more interesting companies, um, you know, bundle, flip, flip Bay and the like, you know, more recently raising capital and, and, and create, trying to create sort of, you know, parallel financial services economies around crypto. So very exciting. Uh, we expect to see more of these. Um, and there are some very clever opportunities I think we're seeing, um, you know, especially for from entrepreneurs who are looking to connect global markets uh, versus just sort of trying to solve the uh, Nigeria only, or, you know, or West Africa only or East Africa only type place. So we expect more activity from there. The big, big, big trend, I think, is that um, the legacy companies in Nigeria seem to have woken up to the power of tech. Um, you know, I still remember, uh, you know, early on when we, when, we, when we first started as a firm back in 2014, gosh, we the market, I feel old here. But, you know, when we talk about tech, there was a lot of what I call a lack of interest in what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. And nobody cared. No, nobody actually cared. Right. And so, you know, we, you know, you fast forward five, six years and you're watching some very interesting trends sort of begin to take shape. Um, you know, one of the things that was interesting was that there's a very zero sum game approach to a lot of the legacy companies in Africa. You know, it was, it was never as collaborative as it's sort of beginning to evolve uh, into now. Um, you know, the first option was we'll buy you or we destroy you, right? And, um, and that, that, that we think is, 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 is slowly uh, diminishing. Um, and one of the things we also saw with legacy companies was this very interesting view about the, the, the availability of their own knowledge, right? So the, the scope and availability. So the ones always thought they were smarter than these young folks showing up. And, um, and you know, of course, they also thought they had the, 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 the scale to, 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 to destroy them. Of course, that has changed, you know. And then there was also sort of the cultural subtext here, which was really around you know, the small boy, small girl dismissive view 
Um, we think that's changing, you know, big ups to a bunch of the founders who are sort of changing that narrative. Uh, but, you know, legacy companies sort of have moved from there. Some of them are really smart and, you know, they're sort of moving from there. Um, the acquire uh, mode continues to sort of be in existence a little bit quietly. Um, you know, and what's really interesting, I think, is that, you know, they can confuse founders and founding teams with salary packages and the like that will sort of bring those founders and founding teams closer to some a net positive um, status in terms of like their their optionality uh, versus sort of buying the business and having to go deal with a bunch of you know third party investors and a bunch of things. Um, and you know we're, we're seeing some of that as well. But the big the big shift now the wave of the big swell is that you know people are sort of beginning to realize that if you collaborate and work together, you can build a, you can sort of construct and bake a much bigger cake that allows each person's share of that cake to grow. Now, remember that you're transitioning from zero sum, which is if you win, I lose. And if I win, you lose to let's work together to, 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 to bake a bigger cake. And so we're seeing more of that. Um, and the transactional volume means that these partnerships are profitable and quite scalable. Now, of course, the challenge is that, you know, the, the, the actual share that devolves to each participant, you know, is lower. And so you have to sort of play the long game in building that out. But, you know, we like that. We like that trend and we, continue, we expect to continue to see more of that. And, you know, and to add more to that, you know, in Nigeria, we're seeing some very interesting legacy companies. You know, Guaranteed Trust Bank, which we believe is probably not just the number one bank by brand, but, you know, but really by... By, you know, by aggression, by quality of talent, and the ability to build, you know, you know, mobile and, 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 and web and platforms, you know, and scale them, um, you know, is, is a ferocious competitor, right? They might not be a fintech, um, but they will be as nimble as one. And, you know, and a lot of people don't pay attention to them because, you know, they're a regular bank and people say, hey, you know, you're just a you know, legacy bank. But... If you unpack what's going on in there and, and figure out just exactly what kind of volumes they're doing, um, you start to sort of realize that, that this could be one of the fintech winners. Uh, you know, essentially V1 goes to V2, goes to V3, and, and wins at every V, right? So that's, that's something that we sort of like to pay attention to. I mean, we wish they were a little bit more collaborative. They, you know, they, 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 they do have a reputation um, for wanting to, to dominate and take over uh, companies and the like. Uh, you know, not unfair trades, if I'll put it that way. So that's something that needs to get sort of figured out. And hopefully that will change. Uh, God is Good Mottos is a legacy transporter with doing sort of interstate transportation. The founder's son uh, took over in 2010. Um, he, again, and this is sort of an interesting, you know, what we call sort of the, the transition of generations uh, and where you're taking very significant offline businesses and saying, listen, you know, we have a different view because we're digitally native, you know, millennials and the like are digitally native. And you're now watching sort of that transition, God is good. Um, you know, they, they have learned how to execute last and mid-mile logistics. Um, and, you know, it's a ferociously well-run company. And, you know, the opportunity for it is, is, is significant. You know, and, of course, finally, Xenox, which, which did the, you know, Conga acquisition. They then merged Conga with Udala. And they're now one of the largest online retailers. And, you know, and what's interesting, I think, as well, is that, you know, everybody sort of thought, you know, e-commerce was going to be, you know, the thing, and then people felt it was not the thing, and then now people are saying maybe it's going to be the rethink. Uh, but you know, e-commerce certainly is going to be an important element of, of shopping, generally, and, and consumption behavior. And and Zinox Dollar is 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 um is is well positioned to capture that in, in Nigeria. So again, you know, when people sort of you know one of the things that I love about investing in Africa is that there's always a sector du jour. It's either you know, e-commerce, then fintech, then it goes to the next thing, you know, and, you know, I think that, you know, going back to e-commerce and some of these traditional things, which are still broken, you know, is stuff that people should really think about because there, there's still some very significant opportunities.
The, the, the final thing I wanted to talk about um, before I sort of wrap this up is, you know, insurance. So everybody talks about fintech, but what's interesting about fintech is that it ends up being um, a discussion around payments and processing and wallets, right? But insurance is a very significant opportunity. Um, you're watching the next generation of insured techs show up, you know, in the US and Europe, they're becoming, you know, they're going public, they're doing some interesting things. And what, what you know, what we've sort of, well, we've, we've had this discussion openly, we've done deep dive into the space. Um, we, we, we're just like, listen, it feels like the evolving market has ignored tech for the most part. I think there's some big opportunities there. There's some there's some interesting views around how we think of risk. Um, you know, Nigerians as a whole are very comfortable with self-insuring. Um, we're never quite sure. I mean, recognize that there's a lot of distrust for traditional insurance companies because they don't pay out, um, and that's also because there's always there's a lot of distrust in the ecosystem. But we think that this is another big opportunity. We're seeing some some rumblings of, of interest in it, and and we hope the entrepreneurs you know sort of start to pay more attention to it because it's 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 out there, and and in many cases it could be quite a lot bigger than some of the other submarkets in in fintech that a lot of you are chasing. And this is the question that we ask, right? I you know, have to jump in there because we're 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 just running over on on time, unfortunately. Um, okay. Um, but what I, what I will say is we will we will we will try and add these slides uh, later on today so that people can actually see the rest of the rest of the session. Um, and also, if you would like to go over to the people tab, you can set up a call with Egosa. Simply click on Egosa's profile. Um, I'm sure he'd love to tell you some more about 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 his his uh, insights from Nigeria, and I think it's been been wonderful to have them. Um, I do. I do really apologise for 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 this, Augusta. We we've just slightly run over the time. There. I know. No, I do. I do appreciate it, and I and I, I think you know. I I had one final slide that I want people to at least look at, um, which is sort of my takeaway message, which is that there are opportunity sets that deserve a rethink, and we've suggested a couple of them. Um, crowdfunding is broken, and that. You know, we think we think our local entrepreneurs should be able to figure out how to fix that. We need to think about insurance, and then we also sort of, you know, with the Stripe acquisition of Paystack, I think the key takeaway is, you know, how do we sort of design better exit support for our startups, right? How what are the measures of health and the like? You know, one of the good things about acquisitions is that people get excited, and you know, I'm really to be grateful for that because I think more and more of these startups will have angel support, which has not happened before, but that doesn't make this any less trivial, the process of getting to an exit or the process of building a big business. And so I think we as an ecosystem will have to think more deeply about this. But these are some of the things that, you know, I think take, as a takeaway, we believe that, you know, the, 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 we're just at the beginning of what's possible with technology in traditional economies in Africa, and hopefully we can see more and more activity in the years to come. Great. Well, uh, thanks again. I do apologize just for, for the lack of time. Um, but as I say, please go over and arrange a call with Agosa. Um, he'd be happy to speak to you. And uh, we thanks, thank you so much for your time. And, and we'll, we'll, awesome. we'll, we'll hopefully share your slides if you're willing to, willing to allow that as well. All Sounds good. Time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agosa. All right.